Welcome everybody to That Poker Podcast, episode 94. It is February 6th, 2021. I'm your host, A. Schwartz, alongside the usual producer extraordinaire, Roscoe P. Coltrane. No drop this time. I would I would just like to say that I'm I, I'm 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 very excited for what Mike Matisau and William Casu are going to present as the legal team for Daniel Legrano and prove that this challenge was stolen. I can see that. That'd be, yeah. that'd be a good bit. <laughs> you should do that bit. Uh, and T Chan, T, how are you, sir? I'm excellent. Uh, just watched some fights. Ready to re- ready to roll into the, the the aftermath of the fight that that we really cared about to uh, the last few months or so. So yeah, we're excited to excited to have uh, luminaries of the game on. Uh, Daniel awesome. Legrand in Las Vegas. Yeah, I just want to point out real quick. Right, we talked about this earlier, but Terrence Chan is officially the Pete Rose of the MMA. Okay? Oh. Come on. Because this is a guy who's a professional athlete fighter with all the inside info. You're no better than all those hedge fund fuckers who are doing insider trading, all this shit, trying to finagle out. What are you betting on these fucking games? You're printing like, what kind of EV is that? So just yeah. want to point that out. He's no yeah. better than fucking hedge I don't fund. think I don't think you get disqualified. I First of all, I'm a retired fighter. I haven't fought in, in two, two and a half years. Second of all, do you really, really think that I had implanted moles inside of Conor McGregor's plant to know exactly that he was going to take a dive in round two? I had absolutely no knowledge of that whatsoever. Or so you say. None. Uh, and we have a special guest this week. Uh, we are joined by uh, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Doug Polk in Las Vegas. Uh, Doug Polk, how are you, sir? Uh, I'm doing good. Nice, nice uh, nickname throwback there. But yeah, it's good to be on. Appreciate you guys having me on. Should be a fun one. Uh, plenty to talk about. So looking forward to it. It's been a minute. I think the last time we had you on the show was like in Vancouver, I want to say like six years ago or something like that. I was yeah. just listening to it in the car. It was, it was, it was, it's amazing just to even listen to the poker strategy evolve. But uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. You were, you were in the middle of your uh, Claudico challenge back then, Doug. Oh yeah. I remember that. Yeah. I, I remember doing that in the middle of that. Um, I also remember swinging by and, and doing a podcast as well, I think, but uh, yeah, the, the Claudico challenge now, our challenge was was a long one, but that one was truly grueling. Truly grueling. Imagine if your opponent had to tank twenty seconds every turn. That's <laughs> seriously. That's what the bot would do, and it was the Never entire that. challenge. That's fucked. Up. That's a piece of shit move. If he did that, <laughs> I, fucking, I ever saw one. Like I promise you one thing. I've always been against stalling, and I would never, under any circumstances ever stall for any purpose whatsoever right um, my mouse wasn't working well that day I, uh, every time I could, could, it was stuck i was stuck in neutral but it I was see. honestly the, the best thing for me out of this challenge you know it cost me 1.2 million but at least i got to see fucking doug steaming beyond steam. <laughs> oh I, I was i was just i was losing it On there was two can, tables uh, yeah. two tables and you're just tanking the button down on both and i i, I just i i couldn't take that on a scale of one to ten, how in you've been tilted in your poker career before? Right? How tilted were you at that moment? Well, it, it's a different kind of tilt. It's not. I'm. It, it's it's hard to describe. It's oh my god! I just want to play tilt. You know, <laughs> it's I just want to play the hands, and I can't do that. I have to wait. And then I would open twenty second tank, second tank call twenty second tank check. Oh, I just that was. That was completely outrageous. I swear to God, I thought of it the night before in the shower. I'm like, all right, this motherfucker wants to start limping and lock it up. He's going to get some of this tomorrow. So I'm in the shower. I'm like, all right, I got my nice coffee. I'm sitting there going, okay, I'm ready to do this for two hours. Let's see how long he can last. To to be fair, it totally worked. Because when when (laughs) we called Galfond and he said, okay, well, Daniel basically said, I I don't make a ruling yet, but on your button, just play normal. And then, you know, on on Doug's button, take your time. And I thought, is this really the direction I want to take this? Is this really where I want to go? I want to be end up in this in this stalling battle and bring in our I said, fuck it. And just went back to raising. All right. Let's set this up. Uh, Obviously, we're going to talk about the uh, the now completed challenge between you guys. Twenty five thousand hands at uh, 200, 400 heads up. No limit. Um, challenge took, I want to say it was a couple months. I didn't look, I should have looked. I'm not, not well prepared. Three months. How many? Two, three, three months, three months. Yeah. So, uh, a fair amount of time. You guys haven't been really focusing on anything else, but this, um, we'll get to, uh, you know, what's next and, and, uh, and how you feel about it in a minute. But, uh, the challenge ended up with a couple of marathon sessions. Um, you guys put in a ton of hours and got through a bunch of hands after, uh, 
after the limping and uh, stalling stop. So um, you know, the match ended. It was 1.2 million, as uh, somebody mentioned, for Doug. Uh, I think we, we talked about All-in-EV a couple of times. All-in-EV was about 250000 Daniel was stuck in, so um, adjusted for that, whatever, uh, a little, little short of a million. Um, and, you know, we just wanted to get you guys together and talk about it today. Obviously, uh, you guys are on better terms than, uh, than you were before this challenge started. Um, and, you know, you guys have done a great job with, uh, with the videos and, and breaking down, you know, individual spots and hands and, you know, what you thought about different uh, situations. And, and I don't know that we should probably go over all that stuff again, because if you want to find that stuff, you can go to Doug's channel, you can go to Daniel's stuff and, and, and see, but, but more sort of an esoteric level about, um, what, what behind the scenes, like what it was like for you guys to go through this three months of, of torture almost really. I mean, for Doug, for sure it was torture. He hates poker. Um, and, uh, and you know what, what it was like in between sessions and all that. So we'll get to it. Um, uh, you know, but I first want to start off saying that I think this match was really good for poker. And we talk a lot about, is it good for poker? That, that term sort of gets thrown around a lot. But and then you guys are in the middle of it and you probably have a sense of how big this was in the poker world, but it really was like there was a lot of attention. And in this, you know, it's sort of a tough time for poker right now. Right. We have, you know, live poker is really tough. You, you know, if you want to go play live poker, you got to play in a cubicle of plexiglass, which or risk if you're in Florida or whatever, getting COVID. So this really gave the poker community from my vantage point anyway, something to sort of rally around you know, pick a side, have fun with, interact in social media, watch your guys' videos. You got a ton of engagement. Um, so, you know, overall, I just felt it was it was the right time and, you know, really, really good for poker. So uh, I want to go back, though, and let's start this way. Uh, sort of a year or two uh, back when you guys weren't getting along as well. Um, and, and, you know, what, first of all, Doug, I mean, obviously you wanted to have a, a challenge of some sort. Um, and Daniel as well, uh, you know, came around, but did you ever think that that it would happen, Doug? I'll start with you. Yeah. So just talking about a challenge or, or a match specifically, this had been talked to, uh, to me at least. And, and I imagine Daniel was approached as well, but Maury had approached me uh, at least on a couple of occasions talking about, you know what the match would be, Doug, the match, the match, if we could have it. And I, and I said, I would play it back then. Um, Obviously, it was at a very different point with everything. COVID wasn't going on. Uh, I think, I think, I think things were in a bit of a different place then. But uh, it was at least discussed at a couple points there. I, I, I really, I really didn't see this happening at all. I've said this just countless times at this point. But so I'm kind of being a dead horse. But I did not think that Daniel would say yes. I was really just bluffing, because if I had thought he said yes, I probably would not have offered it to begin with. So I basically just said, oh, yeah, let's go. I'll play you. And then he said, all right, let's go. And I thought, oh, OK, OK, I better start studying. Um, so, yeah, so I, I never I never thought this would happen. Question, I just want to quickly stop you right there and ask you, sure. like some of the stuff that went on, the billboards, the T-shirt and that kind of thing. How much of that was trying to get a match, even though maybe you didn't know it was going to get accepted? I, I it wasn't some long term hustle to get a match. It was just you know, it was a mixture of a few things, and obviously we can we can talk about it on a subject by subject basis. Uh, I, I don't really want to get into the tit for tat no. stuff. I, I really I I feel like we're past that, and, and I, I kind of want to keep it that way. Um, but you know, first off, a lot of it is of course for the lulls. I've always done a lot of things for the lulls, and, and I think there were some good spots for that. And then I did believe in in a lot of the things that you know I was arguing and, and my side of some of the you know disagreements. Um, and so those those were two you know primary motivating factors. Uh, I, I also you know, and I've said this before too, but I, I think that I, in retrospect I, I went a little too hard in some of the personal attacks and stuff. And uh, I think I think that there's a, a line you can draw where you can make your point and you know say what you need to say without going so hard on some of the things that Daniel done in the past that I, I think that was a little bit a little bit over the line. So um, I, I apologize for that. And, uh, you know, not, not that not that I think, you know, I think and, and I, I'm sure in, in a lot of the issues, Daniel still thinks he was right. And we could probably go back and forth on some of that stuff. But uh, on the personal level, I, I think that I took it probably a bit too far. And uh, yeah, I, I think that sums it up. Daniel, before you said yes to the challenge, how much did you think about actually doing it? Like other than, you know, when you tweeted, let's go. Was there any kind of, you know, in the, oh, maybe I'll eventually do it? Or did you say, screw it, let's do it? Yeah, there was really nothing on my radar. You know, I hadn't talked to anybody about a challenge or whatever. And then, I don't know, it was really like, because we'd sort of, 
you know, the whole whatever, you know, thing we had where it was sort of like died down anyway. He was out of poker. He's basically gone or whatever. And somebody tweeted something and I decided to fucking throw out a meme of a guy talking a bunch of smack and the other guy fucking smacking him down, referencing super high rollerball where I beat him in three pots. My God, I fucking got him three pots in the super high rollerball. So I own him. Right. So that sort of, you know, re-energized something. And then, you know, we started it back and forth and then I thought about it, you know, I thought about, well, it's COVID time, right? We can't really go anywhere. Um, we're not going to anyways. And then, you know, you know, and I've shared this with him and I've shared this publicly too. I thought like, all right, well, you know, he sort of threw it out there. This was the first time, you know, it was official, like, okay, let's play. And I was like, all right, well, listen, like, A, I can afford it. B, my thought process was we'd be able to play this on GG somehow, right? So I thought, okay, this is going to be really great promotion for GG because you're going to have all the eyeballs, right? Watching GG, you know, promoting GG poker. I'm like, this is a win for me, right? So then we realized that like, you know, I did, I, I agreed to the match now and I'm over in Cabo playing the World Series poker while he's fucking grinding already. You know, he's getting better and I'm just, I'm playing like, uh, you know, nine max $300 tournaments, right? Which isn't helping me very much. Um, but, uh, where was my, what's my train of thought? How did that happen? Whoa, so my brain's still messed up from the whole fucking match. You wanted to promote GG, but oh, yeah. it couldn't so, happen. So then we realized like, you know, we talked to some lawyers because what we thought we could do, this is what, what I thought we could do is we could use the platform, right? And play for, you know, play money or whatever and sort of skirt around it. But then, realizing, you know, talking to lawyers and stuff. And it's really still ambiguous and unclear. Uh, I talked to Galfon who tried to do this as well, but, uh, but ultimately there is regulation in Nevada. So this would be kind of a way to circumvent that regulation because it's obvious we're playing for money, right? It wouldn't be a case of like, oh yeah, it's just for charity, you know? It's all, you know so, so it was too obvious there. But now I've already agreed to the match, right? But now like sort of the big carrot or the big value that I foresaw is gone. So now I'm like, oh, fuck. Well, I'm not going to do, like, he, he got caught bluffing. I got caught fucking calling, and now I have, now I, I call them the turn, and I have nothing on the river, and he checked, and I'm like, oh, shit, okay, fuck, I don't know. Put it in. What do you want me to do? So now I'm already in, and now, of course, I have to start, like, studying myself, because the last time I played heads-up poker was, like, the Isildur days. You know, we played, like, a little fun match here and there, and that was, like, completely different form of poker. You know, there was no solvers. Nobody was using that stuff. So, um so yeah, I mean, once I agreed to it, like, I'm not going to, I thought, I mean, I thought it would be a real pussy move for me to make him like, I, people told me to do this. Several people said, dude, you should make him work his ass off to play. And then last minute go, you know what? Nah, I don't feel like it. <laughs> I was been, afraid of that. that. Been, yes. That would have been pretty good troll. I would have took a lot of shit for that, obviously, but it would have been like a really annoying troll. I've never had any intention of doing that, but that would have been. Well, I got a little worried because you delayed it a couple of times. And then I thought, not only you might do that, but then you also might just keep perpetually delaying it. And then it would be just a nightmare to deal with. You know, if you, if you said, oh, mid December, it started to seem like it might go that direction to me. I didn't think that that was super likely, but I was a little bit worried about that for, you know, a little four bit or five worried. You went off on Twitter. Come on. <laughs> there were yes. some tweets about, uh, let's get this fucking thing started already. I think you were yeah. more worried. Well, I was I was caught in a bind because all I was doing was preparing for this and then it kept getting delayed. So I wasn't sure what the game plan was. And we, we hadn't really hashed it out one on one yet as far as what the game plan was going to be. So, yeah, I was I was I was getting worried. So let's talk about uh, the negotiations, how that went. So, uh, Doug, I think you put forward you're going to you wanted to play no uh, heads up, no limit, hold them in another game and of Daniel's choosing. And you guys maybe negotiate about that. Um, first off, I'm curious what you thought Daniel might pick as far as the other game and, and how much of an edge you think you, let, let's, whatever game you pick, how big of an edge do you think you would have been giving up there? Well, I, I don't think it would have been that much. I, I actually played a good chunk of heads up eight game before uh, sort of the end of my online poker career. So I have actually played a, a, a decent amount of heads up eight game. I'm pretty good at most of the games. At least I was then. It's been a long time. So I, I felt that whatever games that we did choose, I would be at least competitive to that, uh, if not, you know, quite good, depending on the game. Um, so I wasn't really sweating what he picked. I, I just kind of wanted to offer something up to make it a little more, you know, fair. If he wanted to have that option, of course, he could choose to do so. So, um, yeah, it just, it just seemed like a reasonable offer. But, you know, I, I think in retrospect, and, and Daniel said this to me as well, I think from from a... Uh, viewer perspective adding in another game especially if it's a weirder variant that people aren't that used to 
uh, I think that that would make it a little harder for people to watch and maybe there'd be less interest in it. So I, I think that that ultimately for the, you know, um, for the viewership and the spectacle of it, I think it was good that it was in Nolan Hold'em. So heads up, Raz would have been boring is what you're well, saying. Well, no, I was thinking like, obviously we were just talking about this earlier, uh, stud eight or better, right? And like, so cards down, No Limit Hold'em was like difficult enough to watch and commentate on. Like cards down, stud eight or better. Oh, he catches a low. Oh, he catches a banana. All right. And then, uh, okay, he's got the low, he's got the high, chop it up. You know, over I, don't disagree. I think it's a great opportunity to introduce, you know, with the spotlight on, on no limit, hold them. Everybody's going to watch that anyway. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to prop up a, you know, a game like stud eight or better or, or some I, sort of a problem, draw game. The real draw problem, games are terrible on the internet, obviously. But. And Doug pointed it out, which is exactly what I was thinking is like, you know, it's just really tough for people to watch. And I thought to myself, okay, so if I would pick a game, the first one that came to mind was stud eight or better. Okay. The problem with the game is first of all, it plays really small, right? Because, you know, so you would have, I don't know what stakes, but probably like 5,000, 10,000. Right. Because here's the other problem, right? A game like Stud 8, let's say that wasn't his best game, but it's mine. For him to be competent or decent or good to where whatever edge that I may have had is so minimal, it's just not even worth it. Like, I mean, it, like to spend all that time on the game, because like that would be, the, like I said, the first game that I would think to pick. Um, the other game that would make sense, that would probably be fun, it's just a game that I haven't put a lot of work into. Like I've actually won probably like $2 million playing it in challenges heads up is PLO. Like I beat, but this is back in the day. I beat Tony Bloom. I beat Barry. I beat a bunch of guys that are like not, you know, online crushers today. I've never looked at a PO solve for, for, for pot limit Omaha. Right. So, but that one would have been, if I was going to choose a secondary game, because I, I, I don't know if you dabbled in it, Doug, but I just figured like the other problem I faced was I'm going to have to learn a whole bunch of shit about no one hold them. Like that's hard enough because heads up, no limit hold them. And, you know, Doug can attest to this is incredibly complex. So having to learn that and learn PLO in four weeks was like, just like not even, a, it was just this dumb idea. Also the, the, with where solvers are at for PLO, it's not as clean as no limit, no limit. You have the, the grid, right? You have the, the cards, you know, you know, you can see all the combos lays them out. In PLO, you can't do that. There's too many combinations of hands, so they have to display it in different ways. Uh, and it, it's it's way more complicated, and it's the, the tools aren't really as sharp. So, yeah, it's uh, it, it would add a lot to just try and learn that game. I've played a little PLO. Uh, I've done well lower and worse higher, but I, I played all the sickos. I thought if I was good at No Limit, I could jump in and, and play the, the top PLO guys and do pretty well, and didn't end up being the case. Um, but... It's a, it, you know, it's a fun game, but it's a very frustrating game at time. If you think you can get lucky in No Limit, Daniel, oh, PLO, <laughs> people can get very lucky. Well, that's, so that's the other thing about picking another game. And if Daniel would have sort of gone to pick another game, and as he says, he would have had to spend some time, but probably less time than Doug would have. And that would have, and Doug, I think, was coming off not playing Heads Up No Limit for quite some time and spent a bunch of time that four weeks in the lab pretty hard. And if he's got to learn another game, maybe that compromises his Heads Up game, or No Limit game a little bit. Um, and, and so, yeah, that, that was the only thing. Like, maybe you're not going to have a big edge, Daniel, in the game, but at least it takes away a little bit from... from he's Doug's. trying to catch up learning how to play Stud 8 or better while, you know, so he can't optimize his No Limit game. Yeah. He's sort of just taking I mean, him in the same eight, like, I love the game, but Stud 8 is a game that it's it, the complexities are like present when there's six players at the table or eight players at the table. So then you have like multi-way pots, which is like really complex heads up too many of the decisions are automatic. All right. Just look, you automatically raise, you automatically call your board is this, you check. It's like, how it would, I would take Doug, like, let's say for example, that was his weakest game. It would take him five days to be like, okay, just do this. And like, if he did that, which I'm sure that he would, he was going to come in with a formulaic, you know, strategy. And then like, what's the point? You know what I mean? It's just like, it's, it's not a game that really, and, I, and again, that was the problem. Like I couldn't think of what the second game would be that would be like, oh, this will make things even. The only thing I could think of was like, all right, but this doesn't work either. Like high stakes mixed game tournaments. Cause I, I, I came second again today. I'm on my way back. I won 130,000. I'm climbing my way back. I'm on nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, okay. So the match gets decided. It's heads up, no limit. Hold them. As Daniel said, he had four weeks. Kind of talk us, give us an idea of what that four weeks looks like. And I, and I think a lot of, and we'll get into sort of the behind the scenes during the match and stuff, because I think a lot of people wanted to hear about what, what it was like for, you know, the team of guys around you guys to, to prepare you for each session. But um, the four weeks leading up, Daniel, we'll start with you. What, what, would, what did that look like for you as far as 
who, you know, let's go find some coaches. Uh, what's, you know, eight hours a day. What am I doing? What, what am I reading? What am I sort of bringing in? What am I taking in? Yeah. So I heard Doug say this too in one of his post games and it's really rang true to me too. It's so I've played no limit all of them for 20 years. Right. It's like, okay, so everything that, you know, forget all of it. Just like start, you literally know nothing now. Okay. So then, you know, working with my guys, they give me like one concept to work. With, okay. So now I'm going playing 25 cent, 50 cent. I'm getting fucking destroyed. Like cannot possibly win. There's no, no way. It reminds me of like karate kid Miyagi wax on wax off. I'm like, why am I doing this? I can't win. Right. So now I, you know, after a week or two, I master that thing. I'm still getting killed. And they're like, all right, here's another concept we want to add. I'm like, okay, cool. Still getting killed. You know, not beating any of these people. Can't possibly win. What? But the idea was to sort of strip and rebuild with like a fundamentals, you know, <clears throat> well, game theory optimal base baseline that, you know, was going to be too difficult if let's say, for example, you throw all the concepts, because there's so many different ones, like, you know, board textures, sizing, all this stuff. If you threw them all at me at once, the, the, the ability to implement that, I, I don't know, maybe I could have, because I'm actually, I do soak in things pretty quickly, but it's just not the best way to learn or teach, I don't think. When you're trying to teach somebody 80 things, like you start with one, then you move on to two. You can't, I mean, you don't really want to teach people 80 things all at once, because here's the problem. Like I wanted to use mixed sizing going in, but the bottom line is Doug was going to be able to pick apart the lack of balance in my sizes, right? So for me, it was probably safer, even though it's not a winning strategy to just use like a 20 and a 75, because at least then I can balance those two. But if I started to like throw in one and a half pots and pots and these kind of things, like he's going to likely pick those apart and then really be able to exploit me, you know? Actually, I, I had a quick question for you. So early on in the challenge, it seemed like you were using on flops uh, multiple sizes on the same flop. Were you doing that at any, at any point? Were you splitting on flops? Or were you so basically? So I don't know if you noticed this in the challenge, but I only used single size on the flop. So if the flop came and I bet, I would bet a size based on the texture of the board. Uh, I mostly, I would say, I think in the early part of the challenge, unless it was a misclick or a mistake, like I was using the same size for certain board textures. For example, like. You know, on a Jack Jack Seven, I was using you know twenty always. Okay. Like an Ace High board, I was using twenty, and then maybe on like a, you know, like a Deuce Three Seven, then I'm using you know seventy five. So I was for the most part, I, I started to mix it up, probably around the fifteen thousand hand mark, where I added just a whole bunch of sizes and was really just going fucking ham and mixing. Yeah. Them. Yeah, like especially the last five thousand hands, I mixed a lot. Yeah, I, I noticed you you implemented some sizes that uh, were, were good. I mean, some of the more sizes I use, you started using a 40% pot on a bunch of boards that were good, so some straight boards, some stuff like that. Um, and the three-bit pot, you were using some uh, 27%, which is which is good. I, I used a, a bunch of those too. So I, I felt I could see the sizing part of your game really developing. Well, and get, you added a 20 too. And, you, oh, yeah. Yeah, you added a yeah. 20 monotone board and stuff like that, which really, for me, this is the one that really sticks out as like really bizarre to me and backwards, but I get it now. Like, in my poker brain, 20 years of poker brain on a monotone board, meaning, you know, three flush. Like I'm thinking like bet big, but like, uh-uh. Yeah. No. Like on those boards and heads up, you just you basically want to check. Like I was in three bet pots. I was mostly range checking. After three betting, I was range checking. I'd be very, like, I obviously bet one time with when it was a monotone, I'd make a fucking straight. And this is why you don't do it because he had a fucking flush on the flop, obviously. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that, there was definitely some, what do you call it? Counterintuitive stuff about what a solver wants you to do with sizes that just seem alien to. Uh, yeah. Mo monotone are really weird. We, we played that hand right at the start. Remember where you had nines and you threw bet and I called and I had jack seven suited and it was 10, nine, eight, all hearts. Yeah. And then you bet, bet, bet and I called down jack seven. And so on that turn, uh, I was actually running that that hand the other day again and just like looking at, looking at that spot because monotone boards are, are just so strange. Usually on the turn, on monotone boards, it prefers the smaller size, which which is really counterintuitive. And I used to play them the same way back when I played back in the day. I thought this is a draw heavy board. I want to charge these draws. But I think what it has something to do is just the card removal aspects, right? Because when you have a heart, let's say it's three heart board, your hand is so strong and you also remove so much of their continue range that it uses small sizes and so it doesn't bet very often. And it gets it gets really weird in, in those spots. It's also kind of similar to paired boards where everything mixes, you know, all kinds of hands bet, but they don't bet very often. It, it gets, it gets weird. 
You don't sound like a guy who hates poker, Doug. I got to tell you. Uh, well, I wanted to read this because this is a, this is really interesting stuff. Because Doug, for like most of your your online career, or may, perhaps all, if if you can correct me, you didn't have access to these commercial solvers the way that people do now. So even though you came into this challenge as like you know the guy who has played way more heads up no limit and a guy who is supposed to be the favorite in this, you actually have to revamp your studying too. So I want to talk about like the way that you studied poker. In the big, you know, in the in the sort of the peak of your your no limit hold'em heads up crushing days, must be so different than now. But you still would have had that confidence um, that you were the better player, even though like a lot of your theories back from you know six, seven, eight years ago, you realize now are completely wrong. Like this is a, a perfect example of it on on these monotone flops. Like so, so you know, like talk about those 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 two things, like being confident that you're the better player because you've got the experience edge, but also at the same time realizing like, oh shit, I don't I don't actually know that know as much about the game as I thought I did. Well, I, I don't think that that I came in as a favorite because of my current knowledge of the game. Maybe there was some people betting on that, but I think what I was more, what I more came in as someone that has played this game type a lot and kind of understands the way that it functions. And then also that I would have the right, you know, I would know the right way to prepare because I have played it so much and I have so much, um, you know, experience playing that game type. I don't think that it's, oh, Doug knows all the optimal bet sizes right now. I didn't fucking know any of these optimal bet sizes. You know, one month before the match, my game was way worse. I, I was actually, I played a bunch of my fans. I said, okay, who wants to play some just, you know, real small stakes just to get some stats in. And I was getting just crushed at $2, $4 by just random people online. Um, you know, while I was developing all my stuff and, and learning things, and then it started to kind of click. And then I think the few weeks before, and I started to beat a bunch of guys at higher stakes and, and, and I felt like I was good going into it, but yeah, I mean, the confidence wasn't that I know all this stuff, you know, I, I, I it was that I knew I didn't. And I was willing to learn and I was willing to spend the time that it took to, to learn these things. And, and uh, the other thing is, you know, when you have access to solvers and good coaches and people that know what they're doing, you can just, you can just take, you know, you can pull up a solver and you can put in these bet sizes or these bet sizes, and it'll tell you the EV of the each player. So you can just look and see, oh, that's better than this. You know, oh, that's better than this. And then you kind of can start applying that to other places. And yeah, it, it, throughout, over the challenge, I mean, I had a number of spots where I, I changed my sizes. I, I started to use more of a 58% size in a lot of spots. Uh, as the challenge went on, I found that was pretty good. Some flush spots, some straight spots. Um, and I used a, a little more, you know, 150, 175 in some spots too. But yeah, you just have to constantly be trying to, to figure out new sizes that can that can help improve your game. And, and I mean, Daniel was doing the, the same thing, so I'm, I'm sure he understands. So stupid and goofy, but I'm like, all right, fuck it. Solver wants to do it, do it. Like, you do it too, and I was doing it. I'm like, all right, I'll do it. But like, if you check call, basically, and then the middle card pairs, it's like just Solver just says, okay, just bet 10% pot every fucking time. Like, just do it. Yeah. <laughs> like, it feels, it's, it's basically a check, but it's not. You know, it's, it's a really, I, I, I don't know, like, I don't, I guess the solver likes that because that card is way better for you. But then you'd think like, okay, well, if that card is way better for me, why am I betting so little? Or I guess because I'm betting so often, you know, it's confusing. But you're opening the door too. But okay, so Doug, let's go back to um, the lead up. You mentioned you played a bunch of your fans, got in some hands and stuff. Um, go about, talk about picking your team and, and uh, what, we, what your day was like for sort of four weeks straight to lead up to it, to get yourself back to that, sort of um, mindset that you were years ago when you played? Well, I, I actually think I had a lot more time than that to, to practice leading up to it. Because I, I think we, I want to say it was in late August, right? That we agreed to do it, I think. Late August, is that right? It was during the PG World Series of Poker uh, International. So that was like July, August-ish. Okay, so maybe, so maybe even early August. And so I had however much in August, all of September, all of October. So, I, I mean, I had, I had almost three months to prepare. Uh, and and I, I think that that, you know, I think that that was actually a, a big deal in retrospect because I spent months preparing while Daniel was streaming tournaments and getting very tilted. I might add, I saw some of the videos <laughs> along the way. Uh, and so, and so, you know, I think, and I think we saw the direct outcome of that. I mean, Daniel's game at the end compared to the start was much more sharp. It was, in all the places he was using much better sizes and, and strategies and understood it better. And he was, he was working in more bluffs and a lot of different lines and he was picking better and better calling hands. So I, I think he was getting just better and better over the whole course of the challenge. And uh, you know, he, 
I, I had a couple extra months there to prepare, w- w- which helped a lot. But as far as my process was, so uh, so first off, I, I really wanted to have coaches that were you know current top players that knew what was going on. Um, I just kind of re- leaned on my network to see who was out there, who was around. Uh, and, I, and I found a couple of Scandi guys that are just, you know, r- they're really two of the brightest minds I've ever talked to in poker. Um, just, 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 I mean, these guys are just so smart. Uh, and it's funny because, you know, in a lot of spots, sometimes we would be talking about a situation or a spot and there's just all of this stuff that they just assume that, you know, and they have to be like, what about that thing? And that you don't know this, it's this, and you're like, okay, thanks. Just making sure it's testing you. <laughs> just, just, just testing, just pop quiz. <laughs> Um, but anyway, basically just learning from people that understand the game at that level. And, you know, one thing that was really weird to me was back when I used to play, I'd always think about what number of combos do I have? What number of combos are bluffs? But then they don't really look at it like that. They just think about what types of hands are certain frequencies. Is this low freak hands, the mid is the high, you know, and then kind of deciphering the difference between those things and having an approach that's more based like that. And so I started to kind of slowly learn in, in, more of those terms, how, you know, how to run my own Sims. Uh, I, I ran a lot of my own stuff over this challenge. I mean, after our sessions, I'd fire it up. And sometimes I'd even send Daniel the, the results I got in some hands afterwards. And just, you know, just the combos that we were supposed to be using or uh, whatever happened in the hand. So, um, you know, as far as the prep goes, it was uh, a lot of time spent with, uh, especially Frab, who was my, my coach for most of this. He, he would prepare notes and, and explain spots to me and talk about the different sizes I wanted to use. Uh, and then I also had um, a team of guys that were producing different prefop ranges that, you know, th- they use neural networks to create stronger pre I, I don't understand the tech, frankly, but they knew some um, of the developers that I knew. And one of them, uh, whose name's Noam Brown, he, he worked with uh, CMU for a while when we did those challenges. He said to them that what you have is just one of the strongest things he's seen. So I just had I just had faith in the people basically that what they were providing for me and the and the, the ranges they were giving me were going to be really good, and then we took those we made some optimal single size solutions. So for example, on some flops my bet size was like 125. You know, if it's an ace king eight flop, I would use 125 percent pot when I did bet, and that was all single size solutions based on these ranges that we had. Um, you know, figuring out if you can only use one size, what's the best size to use, and then making categories. Okay, if there's no deuce through six. We're going to use 125 if it's an ASI flop, stuff like that. So basically, I started to slowly map out all my sizes, start to understand them, memorize them, start to build, uh, you know, basically my knowledge and, and, and understanding of those spots. And then I would take those sizes, those sims, and I would play against them in a trainer so I could get used to, okay, this is this, this is this, this is this. And then when I would be really confused, I would open it up and it would show me the, the, the grid. I used a lot of, G, of Lucid GTO was the program I mainly used for that. And it would essentially you could pop quiz yourself by playing through it. I think you, Daniel also used uh, some kind of trainer tool, something similar that that I heard about at the start. Actually, what what is that? You're using hybrid poker? What what was that you guys were talking about? Yeah, it's not public, I don't think, but it's basically like it's you know probably similar to what you know you're talking about, which is like a GTO driller, where you know essentially you know you're you're put in spots and then you're supposed to and then you put in spots, you're supposed to make decisions based on what you think, and then you compare it to you know, the actual frequencies of what you're supposed to do. And then it shows you the grid and all that kind of stuff underneath under the hood of like what hands do exactly what, and and you could do it two ways. One, you could do like, just, I started by just doing range drills only. So basically I was in spots where I didn't see, I didn't have whole cards. I didn't have whole cards. I just had, okay, you know, okay. So you, you bet he, you know, he calls a flop is nine, six, four. He checks. What do you, what does your range do? Right. So instead of like looking at the hand that I had, I was like, all right, my range should entirely um, do, do X and Y. And that was just to get me familiar with sort of like understanding how to think like that. Then once I got that down pretty good and actually did, then you start doing it with actual hands, right? Because obviously, you know, there, it's gonna be, well, you know, when you just do it with an entire range, you're, within that range, you're gonna do this more with these hands, these hands, and you know, maybe not some of the other ones. Like, so that was the harder part, but it was it was necessary for me to go through just sort of like the range drilling first, so that I could even get to that. And that's kind of what I used to, uh, you know. And I would make notes as I was doing it and stuff, just to be like, all right, okay, it seems like it likes this size more and that. And that's how I learned um, at the time, because you know, early on, just when to choose the seventy-five or the twenty. That's how it started. 
I'm like, all right. So, cause we, like you said, you know, you're trying to um, figure out the best size. We were just going with two. I'm like, all right, it likes to bet here, but it, you know, let's say for example, it likes the small 63% and the big 25, then I would just use the small. Right. Uh, Doug, I want to ask you, and this is a, a great part to jump off on, is so the, the new way of studying, the, the 2021 way of studying, where we get these perfect answers because of solvers, and you know, we, we, you know, we have drillers and stuff like that, it's a very different way than the p- way that poker players used to study, again, back, when, back where you were on the top of the heads-up no-limit world. Um, you've talked very publicly about how you kind of hate poker. Um, is this part of it, is that it feels less creative like it's just you know in the old days you were just like you know i i played this hand and i asked like five of my friends and we talked about it and maybe we we did some arithmetic on some spreadsheets and stuff like that but now you're just like well this is the hand put it in the solver let's go let's see what it was okay we're gonna raise 78 percent of the time is is that part of what makes it less fun for you yeah so just a small just small difference in the way that I would say put this is I don't hate the game of poker. I, I, I love the game of poker and I'm very thankful for what it has given me. I mean, I had nothing when I found poker. Uh, you know, I went from driving my dad's beat up minivan down to Barnes and Nobles to try and read some poker books and then just put them back because I couldn't afford anything. You know, I, I mean, poker has given me everything I have, so I, I have nothing but good things to say about it. What I, what I hate is uh, playing poker now. It just I just don't enjoy it. And I really don't enjoy the direction that it's heading. And a lot of it is because the skill set that's required to be good at poker is not, you know, I, I can't even say it back in my day, but you know, back in my day, you had to come in and, and figure some shit out and have some strategies that you came up with. And, and there was, you know, different people had their own strategies. I came up with all kinds of different cool stuff that I was doing. You know, this uh, jam, the low board runouts. Uh, where the person can't have straights. I was doing that in, in 2013. I've been doing that for so many years, you know, and some concepts like that ended up being really, really good and applicable to today's game. But it was, yeah, people had to make decisions about what do I think is actually correct? What do I think is good? And when you played someone, you were sort of the sum of all of that. And I was always very open when I played someone is what they're doing better than mine. And if I thought it was better, I would take it, you know? So that's why through all my battles I had, I picked up things from different people that, you know, I remember seeing uh, uh, Alex uh, Millar, Kanu, as everyone would know him online, uh, jam with the nut flush blocker. And I thought, huh, oh, that's interesting. They can't have the nut flush. Uh, and so I started doing that in some spots, although it ended up not being correct. But, you know, who knew? Um, it's actually a lot, in a lot of flush spots, you want to bluff with middling flush cards because if you have the high one, you block the hands that called the prior street to fold because you block the draws that would call. And there's more combos of that versus the actual nut flush. Anyway, not to get super off track. But I would take stuff like that and I would, I would put it into my game and I would, I would build off of that. And now it's just not like that. Now it's who can be the most disciplined and efficient at taking learned stuff and putting it into your game, at least, at the, at least in the online world, it's more like that. Um, certainly in Heads Up, but it, it's the same thing in Six Max and Ring Cash games. I feel that a lot of the creativity that you used to have to have to really get to the top level is kind of has kind of been replaced with who has the dedication to spend the most hours grinding the Sims, grinding the solvers, grinding out the study in this fashion. And at least the way I feel is that did that at least to me kill a bit of the soul of the game. Now that doesn't mean that you know th- there's not cool spots that come up or you can't have your own take on some situations or maybe you get some some places where exploitative play can be really good but at least if you're going to play something competitive at the top level which is the way i always wanted to play poker it's not about your fucking opinion anymore it's not about that it's about who's going to put in the hours memorizing learning understanding these combos analyzing studying and correcting their play and that skill set it just it just isn't that fun to me that's not a fun you know, that's not fun. You know, it's not the same. I want to echo, like, I want to piggyback what you're saying too, because like, you know, when we, we had that discussion about pre-flop charts and all this shit, and obviously that's something people have been doing for a long time, but like experiencing it myself, thinking to myself, you know what, like this really, this part sucks in terms of like what it does to poker, where you could literally, like you were saying too, you know, when I, when I was, where you're like, you're making no decisions whatsoever. You're not actually doing anything. You're basically just essentially reading off of a, piece of paper what's already perfect or whatever so you like if both players are doing that and they're let's say obviously one person may have better information order but if both players are doing that it literally just means like okay the, the hand doesn't even start till post flop so like nothing that happens pre-flop like matters if both people you know people are, you know using strategies like that so that's one of the things that i think is 
you know, where live poker always has a benefit because obviously people can study these charts, they can work with them, they can learn them. But when you play live, you have to like actually remember. And you know, you have to decide, all right, well, I'm supposed to raise this 37%. How am I going to do that? Like, how am I going to actually do that? Rather than, you know, having a sheet, having a random number generator that says, okay, boom, look, do this, you know, do that. So that part of the poker, um, I, I, I echo what he said. Like, I mean, there's, it's obviously got more extreme than that, but uh, yeah, that's something that I just, the problem is I don't, you can't police that. Like you can't ever get to a place where online poker says, no, you are not allowed to look at your notes. Like, I mean, that's, there's no point in having rules that are unenforceable. It's interesting, right? Because, you know, Daniel, it seems like you love poker as much as you've ever loved poker. And this has got you back into it. And Doug, you probably dislike poker as much as you've ever disliked poker. You're trying to get away from it. <clears throat> and I wonder to Daniel's point, if it's, you know, given that da Daniel's more of a live uh, person who, enjoy, who does well and plays in nosebleed tournaments and stuff. And Doug, you're an online guy and didn't really spend a, a bunch of time playing live. I wonder if you just got burnt out faster because it's, it's uh, internet poker and, 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 you know, today. I, I think this is just a really tough subject for people that still really enjoy playing poker to understand. But there came a day when I was playing and I just I just felt I just don't want to do this again. And and it's just so hard to explain that to people that haven't had that feeling. And it started just to haunt me every time I played. And, you know, at points in this challenge, I, I struggled with that a bit. And I think until you felt that way, it's just so hard to really explain to people that haven't, you, you know, and look, if I love poker, that'd be fucking sweet. That'd be so easy. You know, I could stay in poker. I could play whenever I could do all kinds of stuff. And, and that would be awesome. Uh, obviously I would prefer that, but I, I just, I just don't, I don't, I, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's not a choice. It's not yeah. a choice that I, that I get to make. I don't know. It's, it's hard to explain the way I used to either. It's similar. I, I, you know, I don't hate it. I, I enjoy playing, but I, I definitely don't love it like I used to. And you know, you just get older and want to do different things too. Right. That's, that's probably a part of it too. Or, you know, the, or some people are, some people just enjoy it and they find the enjoyment in, in playing it and others, others move away from it. It's, you know, yeah, like, I think like Doug, you, you do enjoy like the content creation side of it, at least to some degree, you've been putting out videos and, and, you know, you, you've obviously, you've got upswing and you want to, you know, that's your business and stuff, but it, it seems like you, you at least do to some extent, enjoy that side of it. Right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's been lots of great moments there. One of the cool things about that is getting to actually work with people. You know, I, I've gotten to work with a lot of great people. Um, in the creation of those videos, obviously, uh, Tom's killing seriously serious, uh, Jamie Crusader did a lot of work with us as well. And, uh, Mike Brady, uh, did a bunch with us too. You know, I, I just, I just love all those people. They're just good people. Um, they're Mike funny Brady, people. Mike Brady and, uh, Jamie were fantastic on stream. I watched so many of those. They were great. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, Let's go back. I want to go back to the first session and, you know, you guys have been preparing for Doug for months, Daniel for about a month. Um, Daniel, why don't you start? What after that first session was it everything that you kind of expected? Can you think back to there and go, okay, this isn't that you know this isn't as crazy and you know as I thought it might be, or was it? Oh my God, here we go. Well, the first session we played live, right? And I'm trying to stick to heuristics, right? Heuristics basically like simple rules of like you do this, you do that, you do this, you do that. And so it was really weird because you know had it uh, had it been later in the challenge, I would have played that first session a lot differently. Because they were spot, it, it it appeared like everyone said like after that session is like Daniel literally never bets the fucking turn, like I mean I never bet the turn like I never bet the turn. Now what what I didn't make public was I was randomizing, right? And I literally whatever you know what as I was randomizing whatever you know system I was using like I just always checked the fucking turn. It was like every every everything that every variable that would randomize for me had me checking back turns and like a couple of times it actually worked out well for me. But um, yeah, I remember the narrative or the post-match narrative is like, you know, incredibly passive, you know, never bets the turn. And it was like, you know, in retrospect, um, like I would have probably, let's say for example, you know, four checks in a row, I'd be like, all right, let's just bet this one. And then, you know, we can, you know, we can level it out later. Cause it just, what ends up happening is like, I don't know from a metagame perspective or whatever, it's like you're developing something like, if you rolled something seven times in a row, let's say for example, I was playing Doug and let's say I'm supposed to bluff in a spot 90% of the time, right? Let's say six times in a row, I don't bluff the river. He sees that. He's not gonna think, he's, he's gonna look at that data and be like, all right, well, what are the odds that he's actually bluffing correctly in this spot? Almost nil, 
right? So, so sometimes, you know, when you're dependent solely on roles, like it can create um, a perception that may or may not be true. And uh, I mean, it's something, it's just some one more added variable to think about when it comes to like adding, you know, RNG, because I never played like that before. You know, this was the first time I ever used RNG, but I did notice there's some spots. I'm like, well, Jesus, I fucking, I've checked here three times in a row. I should just bet here. Oh no, you rolled 99. So check. I'm like, fuck, I don't know. You feel like a victim. Then you sort of feel like a slave or a victim to the RNG where you're like, you know what? I want to override this bitch. Cause this is like, this is ridiculous right now. <laughs> So yeah, Doug, there there are definitely online players that do that. You had to have, you had to prepare for a wider range, right, Doug? Like of of what you would face, right? I think. Yeah. Daniel, so, oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm just going to say that I think Daniel probably had a narrower range of what you he thought your abilities and what his coaches thought your abilities would be, and you probably had to prepare for a wider range of what Daniel might, you know, he might learn a whole bunch in this four weeks, or he might you know, be really, really bad. Well, that's even, let, let me ask that slightly differently, um, Doug. Do you, did you come in here sort of thinking like, I'm just going to try my best to play as close to to perfect, to close to DTO as I can, or am I going to actually, you know, try to beat this guy for as much as I can because I think I'm the better player and try to really exploit him? So my, my attitude with this was, and I had at least some small ideas the way Daniel would play because he did some practice matches at WSOP. He may have seen some of mine on WSOP. I also played some Nace Sierra. I don't know if he, if he got any, um, saw any of those, but I had some, some general ideas. What I was most interested in, in terms of how I would play versus Daniel was what sizes he was going to choose because I did not do much exploiting this challenge. Um, despite, you know, some people, particularly some of my friends yelling at me too every day, I said, look, I'm just going to play my game. I know if I, if I play my game and I execute at a really high level that I'm going to have a really good chance to win here. So I'm just going to play my game and not really sweat what Daniel does too much, especially because his game, first off, it was constantly changing. He was doing different stuff all the time. He was constantly changing his, his FOP term river sizes. There was points where it was you know, 75 early on, and then there was pot, and there was 66 in there. There was 50% pot turns. I mean, there was, a, there was a lot of different sizes in all the different spots. So I really just wanted to know what sizes he was going to use so I could prepare for those. I could prepare for how you're supposed to play against those. Um, early on, it was a little strange because I had done no prep work versus 20 or 75. Those are not common sizes that people use, mainly because they're just not quite as good as, for example, 3366 or, um, you know, 27... 66 or break or splits like that so they're fairly uncommonly used sizes and there are some subtle differences you know if someone bets 75 on a flop you might think oh that's the same as 67 you know but there is some you know it's a little bit bigger there's a few hands that might be too light of floats that you can't float there's there's some very subtle slight differences that you have to make for that and with 20 versus 33 or 20 versus 25 Again, there are some subtle differences. You have to play a little bit looser, call a little bit more, raise a few different hands, be a little bit thinner for value on your um, on your check raises, stuff like that. So, you know, I think from my perspective, what I most tried to counter from what Daniel was doing was his sizes, because it's hard to constantly try and play correct against lots of different sizes. You have to always be thinking about your overall range. There were a few spots that I think um, I made some adjustments for Daniel, but Overall, the majority of spots Daniel played at least pretty well in, and it wasn't that it wasn't the situation where you could just print a bunch of value, you know, because he's doing something really badly. There wasn't there wasn't very many spots that I thought he was playing bad enough to where I felt I needed to deviate from from optimal. Yeah, I saw you. I watched your video where you talked about, um, you know, your overall impression of Daniel in different spots. It was really fascinating. If anybody wants to check it out. Um, on YouTube, uh, you know, you you broke down Daniel's what you thought about Daniel's, you know, pre-flop, his his flop play, his you know, um, check check raising turn stuff, all kinds of really interesting spots, and and you know, you seem to regard Daniel's game pretty high, and 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 I wanted to quickly ask you, sort of, you know, the evolution and over the twenty five thousand hands, um, you know, what you thought about Daniel's play at the start, and then what you you thought about, and it did it very much by the end. I think I think Daniel played uh, pretty pretty consistent with where he was at at the time, right? So, if we play a session on Wednesday, I, I'd get you know a similar version on Friday versus a similar version on Monday. But there was always changes and, and optimizations that were happening on those different games. I don't think that he played 
you know, two radically different sets in the session until near the end, he played a few sessions where he, he was clearly in a situation where he, he th you know, thought I need to create something here to be able to have a chance to win this down a bunch of buy-ins. Um, but I think, I think Daniel played very well overall. I think if, I think if people saw how well Daniel played at the end, I, I let's just say in a fantasy world, we did a rematch, which I, I'm not asking for. I need to be careful here. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think the line would be the same. I think Daniel wouldn't be as big of an underdog the next time around because he's worked out so many of the kinks of the, you know, the problems he had at the start versus at the end. Uh, and I also think the most important thing is I, I think, I think he started to kind of loosen it up on some bluffs in some spots and, and that makes your life a lot harder uh, as the opposing player, because you have to be, you know, constantly ready to, to bluff catch in different spots. There was one hand where uh, he, it was a flush turn and he took bottom pair and check raised turn and just bombed the river. And I, I had a flush or trips or I'm sure I had something, but um, you yeah. know, I, what I have, sorry. Aces with the ace of hearts. Oh, aces. I had aces. That's right. And uh, you just blast it off there. And I just don't think that that's a play. And maybe if you think that otherwise, you know, you can talk about this, but I just don't think that that kind of play you would be making early on. Do, would you agree with that or, or actually what do you think? so it's it, what's interesting and i'll share with you because um i thought you got i thought you played better and better as time went on and specifically on mondays i, I mentioned this in my post game like you know I'd, I'd have a good friday session come back two days on monday and the thing that we were you know maybe seeing as a, as a leak or whatever is fucking gone disappeared right one of the things that you know when we run sims or whatever like one of the things and you've shared this before one of your you know tendencies that's opposed to gto is over calling Right. So we saw, I definitely saw a lot of like, you know, overcalling in the first half. So as a general exploit, and I thought that I wasn't going to be able to play game theory optimal as well because I didn't have as much time. So for me, one of the exploits was going to have to be trying to take advantage of your, of a weakness, which was overcalling. Right. So in a lot of the bigger spots, you know, you were, you were looking me up, like there was one where I was like, what the fuck? Three, four, five, six, nine with three fucking diamonds, three, four, five, six, nine with three diamonds. I bet the turn, I bombed the river. And I looked at his hand three times and ace, king, no fucking die. Like this fucking, okay, cool, bro. In other words, don't fucking bluff this guy in main lines because he just doesn't fucking fold, right? Here's what's interesting. And, I, and he, he obviously made a significant adjustment. He had a complete handle on the match. And then on a Friday, I just fucking bomb him for 390, right? So all of a sudden, you know, we go from down 800 to 700 to like, you know, back in business, right? And, uh, one of the things about that session, the reason I won so much is because he was not folding. Okay? He does not, he did not like clicking the fold button all that much. Right. So I was upping my sizes and really just taking value into the big, you know, uh, pot and over, over pet bots. Then he comes back Monday and he's the limping princess all of a sudden. Right. And I'm like, Holy fuck. And now he's folding. Cause you know, what's crazy. This is the most frustrating thing. The day when you started limping is the day I hit more fucking hands like I flop, I flop like on a 10, seven deuce. I flop off three deuces. You turn a nine river of four. Now you're fucking making folds. It's like you went from, you know, if you had a pair there, you're, you're going to see my hand to now, you know, against a lot of my lines, you started folding. So that's part of why I also said, okay, well now that he's folding in some of these spots, it sort of opens up some more bluffing lines that I felt like were mostly close. Cause in a lot of the main lines, you like you're a really tough guy to bluff. So I, the only bluffs, the best bluffs I got through were what I call bougie bluffs. Like bougie bluffs are, you know, just weird, bizarre, like three bet river bluffs or like check raise three bet the board four, 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 three, three, like really goofy shit where you're like the guy just like never bluffing like spots where, you know, him and his two, like, you know, or they would be like, well, he never bluffing here. I'm like, yeah. that's where I was bluffing. <laughs> there were some comments at, at uh, Doug Polk head headquarters were made about never bluffing and some of those that afterwards I felt a lot less good about. Um, yeah. So I, I think um, um, as far as the, that one session where I lost, you know, almost 400, uh, which is the single biggest loss anyone had. And you what were down, really, like you were down 500, I think in that session or close to it. Yeah, like 460 or so. Yeah. Okay. Peak. All right. Uh, what really sucked about that session wasn't the loss. It was the running afterwards and realized I had just made a bunch of spewy calls. So it was not only had I lost a lot, but I had also, there was a bunch of spots where I pure called and it was mixed or I mixed called and it was pure fold. It was, I, I probably punt called off about 125 K of that 390 or whatever. 
And then, you know, some of it was close. And then obviously 100, 150, whatever was just standard, 200 was just standard. I mean, obviously when you have a, a, a session that bad, you're going to have a bunch of standard spots, right? But I really had a bunch of bad calls that in the moment, I wasn't really thinking about how bad it was to call these hands as often as I did. And then I had to just kind of step, take a step back. Okay, if, you, if, we, if we play this station eight and we're to where we can lose 400K in one session, just stationing off, I'm going to have to really... I'm going to have, I, I can't just do this. You know, if I do this again, this thing is just anyone's ball game. If we have another 400 sessions. So I, I kind of had to change the, the attitude I had going in because there was a lot of side bets and stuff too. I couldn't just punt call off another 400 K that just couldn't or 120 or whatever it was. That was the, the punt portion of that. So uh, I really tried to, after that session, change my uh, call frequencies to, to, to try and make sure that they're in line. And, and, and I, one thing I started to do was if I thought it was close, I would just throw in some extra folds than what my instincts were. So if I thought it was a 50 fold, I might fold 75. Or if I thought it was a, you know, that kind of thing to where if I was over calling, it would be a degree less bad than what happened that day. Yeah. Daniel, so um, tilting is obviously <laughs> better than tilting. We are getting that one. We're going to get sued for for sure. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, uh, to, in between days, and I know some people on Twitter were asking about exactly, you know, oh my God, uh, if this is what poker has come to, you got teams of guys, like, how am I going to, why am I, what am I doing? But, you know, obviously this is a different situation, but I'm curious as to what your protocol was in between days. So you'd play a Monday. What's a Tuesday look like? Like your coaches come over and you're in the lab for 12 hours straight. What, what did that look like? Well, first of all, nobody comes over. This house oh, right. COVID, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you what, the work, the majority of the work happened in the first half of the match. And then I was mostly on my own for the second half. Um, but, 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 the, but we were very regimented in the first half where, for example, you know, we play on the Monday, probably be done around five, five thirty. I would record the sessions. Right. Um, and then, you know, around eight o'clock, we would go over all the hands and the sessions were very, very long in the beginning because I was making a lot of mistakes, just a shit ton of mistakes. And as I got better and better, you know, the sessions got a little bit shorter. And then we started to sort of, instead of watch the entirety of it, just kind of like take, um, you know, maybe, you know, like the, the more meaningful pots or, or whatever. And we really like solve those down and take a look. But for me, the most, the most value was, you know, post-session. I know, you know, Doug was doing the same thing. Is like, okay, I made a call here. I made a fold here. Was I supposed to? Like what, what did the solvers, how big of a mistake this was, was it, or was it really, really good? Um, Cause there's a lot of spots where, um, you know, you just don't know. Like, I mean, at least I didn't, like, I just didn't know for sure if I'm supposed to be like, and also not just like, should I have called with my hand, but like what hand should I have called with? Cause that's where like a lot of the learning comes from. Right. So, you know, now I say, okay, my hand was full, but like, okay, well, what, what is the, what are the types of hands that I would call? And that's probably the one thing that solvers blow your mind with is just like, how, you know, when it comes to bluff catching, it will take a hand that ranks so much worse often. And it's way, and it's like says pure call with that hand. And then with top pair, it's like saying, no, you can't call with like King Queen here because Queen blocks all the fucking straight draws and everything like that. But you can call with deuces, <laughs> you know, like deuces are just fucking, I don't know. Solver seems to think ace deuce is like trips. It's crazy. So it uses that hand a lot, but anyway, so the process was that, you know, and then like going over sort of like adjustments, uh, things, you know, up, updating some of the things I was doing. There's one funny thing. And I shared this in the post game. This was fucking funny. So we would, at the end of the session, I would send him my balance, like, or whatever we'd say, like, cause we have to keep track. Right. Because the they, W so can't do, do that stuff. So I sent him, I was busy and I was just about to go do the, you know, do the post game. And I just sent him a screenshot of my balance on my desktop. Okay. So I took a screenshot. I send it to him. And then he's like, what? Doug Polk exploit ranges. <laughs> on the damn desktop. Specific ranges with frequencies of like what I should be doing in fucking four bit pots, right? I just fucking handed him my battle plans, right? Like fucking halfway through the match. I'm like, oh my God. Well, uh, now what, right? <laughs> I mean, now it's like, okay, well, he's seen it exactly. I don't, he's probably has, a, I don't know if he's a counter or just didn't give a shit because it's like, whatever. But now I'm like, well, I can't really do exactly that anymore. So I have to update it and change it, you know? I don't know. You should, he could, he could have thought that it was fake. He could have been like, Daniel's not oh, going to be that I stupid. I thought just... of that. You know what yeah. I thought of doing? 
I swear to God, I thought of like this. I said to my guy, I go, can you make me a fake one? And I'll send another one that says updated exploit ranges. <laughs> Maybe you'll go with that one. Oh, we're on the same page. I, I don't know if this is going to make you feel better or worse, but I didn't, when you sent me that, I didn't even bother fucking looking at it. Cause I, cause I, first off, it could be fake. Second off, I don't know if you're going to keep doing it. And then third, my pre-flop stuff is just created by these guys. It doesn't, it doesn't have any exploit variation so i would have to take what they do and then you know what i'm saying it was just too so i went back to like more of a gto score best strategy for a session and a half and okay. then i went right back to it nice <laughs> because i really you... liked it i don't know if it's good whatever but it seemed good um you know with ace queen off were you were you four back calling or four back folding depending on stack size like at 100 okay. at 100 i'm, I'm calling like okay i don't know like 115 120 or depending how much i'm stuck <laughs> you know, like, nice <laughs> obviously later in the match i was way more apt to call with ace queen um, yeah but uh, yeah i was four betting that one pretty regularly oh there's one hand i want to talk to you about that that we we talked about but afterwards I, I think that there's a chance you guys might have not run it correctly do you remember the hand where um you had the jack i think it was the second or third third nut flush it was a three bet pot and the, the river made it four to a flush. And I think you had the, the third nut flush, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I checked and you checked back. And you ran it and you said the solver said check. Did you input leads into that spot? I don't do it. Like, I okay. Don't, I, don't, I don't even know how to do it. Because like, if, you input, if you input leads, it is a jam there. And well, I play leads you there. You're leading there on the river. Yeah, I do some leading there. And I also time banked my normal, you know how I would time bank this, like about 10 seconds before I would do decisions in those spots? It's a bit of a tell that I, I'm going to have betting ranges because when I do that, it's because I'm just everything through my range, right? I mean, I could have been doing that in spots I'd only check, but I didn't get that far into that. But anyway, the point is I would have leads there and it would be kind of balanced. I would lead some bluffs and I would lead some stronger flushes. Um, and so basically some stronger flushes that uh, unblock you having flushes, you, know, you see what I'm saying? So like if I had like king 10 of clubs, that hand is a good trap. But if I have, you know, the king with, you know, some unpaired other card, it's a good, whatever. You understand the point I'm making. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if, if I'm leading flushes in, in a four flush spot like that, then you have to, you should be jamming the jack basically. But if you don't put in leads, then it is a check. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, don't know. You guys played 25,000 fucking hands. How the hell do you remember one hand? Like, holy shit. Yeah, no, I remember exactly the hand. Yeah, it's funny how you can go through that many hands and remember. You know what? I, no, you know what I remember. I don't know. Do you know? Because you played a lot of these matches. But is it normal? It can't be normal to play twenty five thousand hands and like get never once all in like win with like out a coin flip. Like is that? That's like. Well, a, how how many how many times did you actually get it in really bad though? Or how how often did that's you really the function of it? Right? Because I wasn't I wasn't getting it in with like twenty percent equity all that often. I got it in with the worst of it a lot more than you did on, on average, I would assume if we went back and looked. And so I, I think that was part of it. And I also think when you got it in bad, it was real. You didn't, you didn't get a lot of hands in that had, you didn't get in, uh, for example, a lot of f f flush draws and stuff like that, where you would have, you know, 36%. You, you tend to either get it in with as a favorite or flip ish or very dead. I had there was I, a decent amount of twenties in there. 20, okay. 25. Yeah, well, some, pre some, some, some pre stuff. It felt, it felt weird to like, I don't know. But yeah, but you know, it was definitely like when I looked at all the all-in pots, it's obvious and it's clear that, you know, the, that, and it's probably a function of just our playing styles, which was like, you know, typically, like if you look, I had the best hand more often than not, uh, you know, in those spots. Also, so, I mean, it's, it's, it is very unlikely, obviously, um, but you ran about six binds under, which is over a 25k hand match is, some, you know, it, it, it's it's not small, but it, I, I put it between small and moderate amount of all any of the run bad for, for that number of hands. I mean, it's not, I've seen some much crazier shit go down, you know, I would, I would say it's it's a reasonable amount. And, and I think for win rate discussions, I see some people throwing around the the number of big wins without EVBB. I, I do think EVBB is a better metric than just pure BB uh, because it just factors out the, the all in aspects. But there are a bunch of problems with EVBB as well. For a variety of reasons, um, you know, you know, we have the hand where I had kings, you had aces. We get it, and I hit a king. So much stuff's happening there, right? I'm winning money, and you're winning EVBB. But the reality is, if we reverse this, it's just happening the other way. So it's it, it's you know, how much does that the hands like that actually change things is uh, is tough to say. 
We'll eventually be able to get these hands, I think. It'll be yeah, interesting. Yeah. What are you going to do with them? What, what's the plan with the content? What are you guys going to do? Well, on my end, if I, if, when I get the hands, I'm just going to just dig in and just see a bunch of different um, stats. I want to look at, um, you know, showdown versus non-showdown winnings, one hand percentage. I want to look at one showdown percentage. I want to look at a bunch of that kind of stuff. Um, I kind of want to see what spots, because there's some spots I felt were going better and some spots that I felt were going worse. And I kind of want to see which ones were, were where. Um, I feel I feel pretty good about I think my in position game was was quite good this challenge. I think my out of position game, um, you know, I, I think in some spots I think it was a little bit weak. I think three bit pots, I think my check raise strats, uh, flop and turn, I think weren't that great. And I think one thing that Daniel did a lot of was on turn when I checked, he bet that spot a lot. I think he was very high frequency turn float bet. And I didn't play check raise there that much. And I think that um, you know, if someone plays high turn float bet, you want to play at least at least optimal check raise frequency. And I don't think I did a good job of that. And there were some example hands that were were kind of clear cut. I think when I looked back afterwards, oh yeah, this hand should check raise, and, and I, I was playing more more either better check call, and and that kind of I think stems from that's how I used to play, and it, it's just such a tough spot to. It's just so hard to be try and be perfect in all these spots you know you're gonna have tendencies you're gonna have things that you lean towards doing or not um and and i think that spot would be one of the, the spots I, I felt i played weakest but it, it, it would be it'd be nice just to see the results it's funny you say that one spot because i was getting well my you know my guys were telling me i was betting way too much in that spot right you know in the flow in, in the three bet pop but like part of the reason i was doing that was like my exploitative brain which was you most of your main lines in three bet pots were bet 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 like you didn't, you didn't have you. There was very few hands where you bet flop and check with the intent of check raise. Like it just didn't. I didn't. I don't remember hardly any in three bet pots. So there was a lot of spots where I had where I thought maybe you were going to start doing it because I was betting some hands I shouldn't have been, like some mediocre like you know deck deny showdown value like two sixes on like uh, you know yeah jack nine four three like you I remember know, that yeah not supposed to bet like hands like that you know those marginal spots but I was betting them because. It didn't feel like you, well, I mean, it didn't feel like, it just didn't feel like you had a high frequency of check raise on the turn. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't play a uh, high enough check raise frequency there. And, and it's tough because uh, turns were, were a bit tough. I, I did have some check raises, obviously, but I don't, just don't think I was anywhere near where I needed to be. Um, it's tough too, because when I bet you jammed there a lot. So tur turns were turns were a pretty tough spot. If I check, you're gonna bet, and if I bet, you're gonna jam. So it's just kind of <laughs> it's not not a lot of great spots for the weekends in that mix, you know. Um, and, and I think sometimes you know it put me in some some spots in the turn where uh, I think I either check called some hands I should check raise, and um, yeah, no, I, I thought I thought that that overall what what you're doing was too high frequency, but I think it it actually made a lot of sense considering the way that I was playing. So did you guys come to an agreement with uh, sharing like cards for each other's content? You guys are going to, here's, here are the hands, go for it, knock yourself out. Or what's, uh, what's the deal with there? Well, I mean, I'm definitely fine sending what, if, if Daniel wants to know any hand or any stat or anything, I'm fine saying that sending the whole database of hands, I have to just double, I have to check and think of if that's what something I want to do. It's just, it's just so much information. I mean, I, I guess I'd probably be okay with it if we were both that, getting, I was thinking more along the lines of like, if you wanted to know what I had in a hand, like I just, you know, send you that. But like, I mean, I don't know, like I don't, I don't really have any plans to do anything with it because I don't know, there's just so much and I even, wouldn't even know where to start. Like I thought before about, you know, making some cool videos or some of the cooler bougie bluffs or, you know, some of the lay downs and things like that. Um, and maybe seeing if, you know, they were good or bad or like this fucking one lay down I was so proud of. And then this fucking guy posts a screenshot with fucking like literally one of the only possible fucking bluffs that exist in this spot after me going off in a post game about how he doesn't have bluffs here. Okay. I had the nuts fucking straight on the flop, nuts straight, 10, eight, seven with two spades. I have the Jack nine with the nine of spades, check, raise the flop big. He bets big. I check, raise big turns the seven of spades. So there's now I have the straight flusher. I check, he bets, I call rivers, a King. I check, he goes jam. And I'm like, what fucking bluffs here? There's no bluffs. What fucking bluff? What bluff calls the flop and then bluffs now? The queen jack of hearts, I guess. <laughs> but the good news is this. So here's the thing, right? Aha, what a dumb lay down there. You know, Solver likes my fold. Right? We both ran it and Solver says, no, I mean, you, you. it's like, because people don't understand. Like, well, you have a straight. I'm like, yeah, I have a bluff catcher, okay? A bluff catcher that's no different than having 
like anything worse than like a really good flush. It's just a bluff catcher because he's not he's not doing that and going to have like king. You know, he's not going <laughs> to kings up. It's, it's, it's not a thing. So so my hand is just a bluff catcher. As weird as that, and that's a weird concept I think for a lot of people to understand is like when somebody bets all in, they're saying I have the nuts, pretty damn close to it, or I don't have anything. You know, there's usually not a lot of middle ground in those spots. Yeah, that spot's funny because I think calling in your shoes is minus five big blind mistake and jamming in mine is a five big blind mistake. But who has the chips? You know, where are the chips at? That's the <laughs> and, and that that hand's actually especially interesting because that turn card is so bad for the big blind that the big blind kind of can't even bet. So a straight is actually not as high up in your range as it would seem that it is because what well, most people might not realize, and I saw those comments too. Oh my God, folding a straight, it's heads up, not PLO or no limit or whatever these comments were. Um, but you actually have a lot of flushes there because flushes can't really bet either. And then you actually have a lot of boats there because your removal, you're going to want to trap. So you actually don't have to call that hand and you're not even that high up in your range, which is weird to think about. But yeah, that was that was a good fault. And also, and you said the solver didn't care, but I thought having the nine of spades was a really bad card. Because I felt like a lot of your barrel bluffs would have exactly that card. No, it is a bad card. I think we might have missed you might have just been that. Yeah, no, having nice spades is bad. Solver didn't like having nice spades there. Um, one other hand I wanted to say, there was a post game you did that I, I I didn't tell you at the time because I didn't want to give up the info, but we played a hand and then you said, Oh, I don't think you I don't think I, if he was buffing there, I'd be very impressed. You remember <laughs> saying that? I don't remember which one. Yeah, I'm guessing you were bluffing. I was bluffing. Who knew? <laughs> uh, it was it was a it was a board where um, it was something like king four three x x and a flush got in, and I think um, did the king pair or it, it paired. Basically, I had a two pair blocker, and we were two binds deep. And you check raise, bet the turn, bet the river, and I jammed. Do you kind of remember this hand? Do you roughly remember what I'm talking don't about? Remember the hand. No. I worked that guy. <laughs> but yeah, but I would not expect you to be bluffing there. Yeah, that's for sure. All well, right. yeah, so go, ahead. go ahead. Well, let's just jump into some tweets. So we put a uh, put a tweet out today, and we got some a uh, couple of questions we want to throw at you guys. Um, the first one is uh, from Jason Taylor. Uh, can you get some GTO bladder control tips from Doug Poker? Doug Poke vids. Uh, watch basically every session. And the only time he sat out was due to limping. I assume no Gatorade bottles with the 360 room cam in play. <laughs> no, that would be something, huh? We yeah. had to take it, take it to the judges. <laughs> I'm just peeing in a bottle. That would be pretty embarrassing. I was trying to get 45 minutes. Cause I typically like my day schedule is like, this is me. I know I was talking to Terrence about how to deal with this. So I was like, I would go to the gym at noon, right? Drink a bunch of water and then have a protein shake or whatever. And then it's like we start at two thirty, and I'm like doing the pee pee dance at three oh eight. Going, I mean, it's a little too early, but usually right around the forty five minute mark, I would take one. And like every forty five minutes to an hour, I would just like literally pee and come right back. Uh, next one is from uh, Reese Edney. Can small stakes online poker, say one pound, two pound, no limit hold'em ring game, still be profitable for players who have not studied GTO? I'm referring to casual, better than average players making about ten thousand a year, playing ten to fifteen hours a week. I uh, love the pod. Keep up the work. What do you guys think? Can uh, online poker players still make it without uh, studying GTO? Uh, Daniel, why don't you start? I, well, I think Doug's clearly like a better person to answer. Oh, go for it. I think it's, I think it's hard. I, I think, I think it's going to be hard. I mean, the, the, the biggest, most important thing to think about is of course the rake and, and we don't want to necessarily go down that that road at this point um but but you're definitely going to want to find somewhere where you don't have to pay a lot of rake because that will be a big factor at those stakes yeah but the games won't be good because when you have more rake the games are typically better i'm not going down this road they are fucking better, <laughs> better. Yeah. better. just say it once doug let's hear you say it. so i guess you could say in this instance <laughs> The more rake. No, I just can't. I just can't do it. <laughs> Man, did this dude just did this? All right. I, I wanted to say something before we go on with Keith because I was thinking about this before. This, just thinking about sort of the trajectory of like how I've known this, how I met him or whatever from the Bellagio when he was 21 years old to whatever. And I wanted to say like, there's one thing that I, if I, if I could do differently, I would have done differently, right? So there was a couple things he did early on, you know, that were, I, you know, with Jason or something like that, or I didn't like, and I sort of came at him about it a little bit. And then, you know, he did his videos on me and stuff like that. But then I would see him 
Like anytime I would see him, he'd be like, hey, how's it going? And be like super nice. But I was like, fuck this guy, <laughs> right? That's what should have said, right? I was like, fuck this guy. So if I could do one thing differently, I would have approached him more from a place of like, uh, instead of like judgment, I would have been like, okay, so do you see what you did there? Here's why I like think that's maybe you should you should handle this a different way, right? So I would have if I would have spoken to him more, just like on a like if I I guess I would have shown them the respect of just having taking the time and saying, yeah, okay, Doug, I get what you're trying to do here, but like the title that's damaging to somebody's career potentially, you know what I mean, or something along those lines. Where I could have said it in a much more civil way instead of just kind of like defending because like there was one specific one. There I know. Was, yeah, there was one that it's like had, yeah. say, said Jason Mercer like cheating allegations, right? And when you when you see like a headline like that in big blocks, like you know, most people think like, what the fuck did Jason do? Right. And it was nothing about that. So when I saw that, I sort of, but I didn't handle it well because I should have just talked to him and explained more like civilly, like maybe we, you know, you can tone that down and you know. Yeah, I got kind of I got put kind of put in a fucked up spot in that one just because uh, and I, I I hate throwing Thomas under the bus, and I, I've always just tried to when shit goes wrong, just take the blame for it myself. But he posted that, and he was just in charge of titling and thumbnails, and I didn't see it until much later. And so then it was in this weird spot, you know? Do you change it? And and I, it, I didn't I didn't know what the correct thing to do from there was, and so it, we had already just we just went with it, and uh, it was a tough spot for me. I mean, I didn't, I because because obviously the reason why that that one's misleading is it it's ambiguous with the wording and, and yeah no i can totally see where you're coming from with that that one that one was one of the most questionable you know if not over the line titles that that we did at and time, like i'm thinking yeah. I, gotta, I gotta stick up for my boy here because jason mercer is you know a friend of mine and stuff like that and i'm like well this is like out of line on jason's part um but i did not take the time to actually like reach out in the proper way and i think if i had you know i think if i had actually been more open to his like friendly advances that none of this would have happened the way that it did but like, I didn't, like, I didn't want to hear it at the time. You know, I was, I really didn't give him the benefit of the doubt, to be honest with you, in a lot of spots. And had I done that in some cases, I think the last five, six years probably would have looked a lot differently, but ultimately, you know, everything happens for a reason. And apparently it was supposed to end this way because I didn't need the $1.2 million anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know what, Daniel, I, I appreciate that. But, and also I feel at different points though, I, I never got the vibe that, you know, Outside of the moments where, you know, we, we were obviously having conflict and talking about that. Uh, I, I always thought that you were nice to me. I, I never thought that you were really rude or disrespectful to me. I, I, I thought at, at times you said things that were maybe a little bit over, over, overly, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the word. Dickish. Uh, yeah, sure. Dickish. Yeah. Yeah. D dickish. One of, one of my favorite ones was when we were talking about the 20 by 50 prop bet to play online. And then I said something like, well, if you want to do this, we get the money together. And then you said something that was like, why would I want to do that? My life is so awesome. Imagine being me or something like that. And I thought, wow, this fucking guy. Wow. Um, but but overall, our conversations were good. It's just when things got heated, I feel like it got, it got spiraled a little out of control. And uh, yeah, no, I think I think that, that, we're, that we're, everything's in a good place now. And um, I think we... We're, 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 I think it's good. I think we're good. I think we've come a long way. In the old days, this you the favor because just in case, just in case, Phil Helmy comes knocking on your door to play some heads up, and like just in case he comes to you, I don't know if he would or maybe would even venture to that. But if he does come your way and you're not interested in playing, I got nothing to do, so you can send him my way. I'm I'm willing to do that. I, I, no, you hate poker, Doug. You hate poker. You wouldn't does, play. Does Phil well. get like a third card or something? Like if that happens, like. <laughs> Phil is the funniest. So he bet on Daniel to win. And I asked him, did you watch any? He said zero. T didn't even take a look. Not interested. Just, you know, betting on Daniel. And then and then says that he'll play me. And then says he's going to limp every hand and that, you know, basically he's won so many heads up matches and he's not going to study. 27 of 29. Well, doesn't he want a price, though? Yeah, he wants 10 to 1. Sorry, 10 to 1, of course. You got to get a price. That's got to be close. <laughs> He's going to live 90% of the hands, so fucking deal with that, son. I, I just couldn't take that. What about you imagine I got a way to deal with it. If he limps 90% of the hands, Doug, here's what you do. You take a coffee, you sit there, you put your feet up on the desk, and you just wait the fucking 20 seconds until it's <laughs> close to zero. Wait, wait, wait. You <laughs> told <laughs> us that you were study. You told us that when he limped in, you had to study all the frequencies yeah. again. That uh... is true. That is absolutely fucking true. So here's the thing. When he limped, 
it like we've I've timed it several times. It takes fuck it took me 20 fucking seconds because I was using an iPad. Da, 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 compare with the fucking, you know, the frequency. It took 20 seconds on that spot. All the rest of the fucking tanking was just me, just me hoping this guy's going. In the big blind. It didn't last 20 minutes. 20 minutes and he fucking stood out. I was ready to go two full hours like that. We had played no hands. My goal for the session was to play two hours, was to play like 150 hands. I was trying to get in. Like, if we got 160, I'm like, all right, we'll throw him a bow. But one, and here's another thing that really tilted me about that fucking session. Because I didn't even hear this, but Doug apparently did. Apparently Phil Galf, because I quit right at 4.30. I'm like, I'm fucking done, right? I quit. He goes, wait, wait, wait. We have 20 more minutes because Phil said, you know, that this phone call doesn't count. And I was like winner at the time. I don't know, like 10, 15,000. Okay. Fast forward 40 minutes later and I'm fucking stuck 200 or some shit like that. <laughs> like 150. <laughs> yeah, that worked out. Yeah. Uh, Phil, Phil like, did oh, say that. Phil Galfon said that. I'm like, wow. Oh, right. playing out of the rack. This is the comments in this video are just going to uh, just on that one. Now the comments are going south for sure. Oh, but we're screening them now, right? Roscoe, we're, we're screening the comments. That's called, that's called chewing your leg out to get out of the trap, kid. <laughs> I love that quote, but uh, Doug, that's got to be close, right? 10 to one. If you played Phil, would you lay him? 10 I, to one? I, I just don't, I just couldn't, I, I'm not going through with that. I'm going to throw, I'm going to do my best to throw it over to Daniel. I've already started to work it in. Okay. Started to work it in. All right. People in general uh, are really uh, afraid of me. I saw another tweet the, uh, this week, a uh, poker tweet that I thought might be fun to uh, to throw at you guys. And it was from uh, Derek Walters. And he says, losing a big sum of money hurts. Here are four stories about the first time I lost 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, and a million. So, and then he went on and told his stories about each uh, each number. So, Doug, can you tell us about the first time you lost 1,000, 10,000, and 100,000 and a million? Each one, huh? Let me think about this. I remember vividly the first time I lost fifty dollars. Remember <laughs> vividly. I know that's not a thousand, but I had run my my twenty dollar online bankroll up to four or five hundred, and I said, "I'm gonna take a shot at the big leagues." I shot twenty. I sat twenty nine cent fifty cent. Okay, big shot. And I remember I opened tens. I was playing heads up, no limit. I hadn't played heads up, but I figured, you know, what could go wrong? I opened tens. He three bets. I call ten four deuce. Prego flop. He bets. And I said, well, at this point, if I jam and he folds, I've picked up, you know, three or four buy-ins at my normal game. I'm just going to ship it right here. If, if you call, you're drawn dead or you're drawn. I jam. He calls aces and he bangs off an ace on the river and my stomach just drops and I just turn away and I just disgust. You know, I'm 18 years old and I just can't even take the pain and the suffering of how much money. It's just so fucking unfair. And I just, I, I, I lost sleep that night. Yeah. The pain, the suffering. Yeah. Um, each, each one's hard though. Each, cause I think, I think you have these moments you remember, but yeah, just, just those, those arbitrary cutoff points. It's. Have you lost a million before? I had a session. I lost a million to Isildur online. That was, I mean, I didn't have all of myself. So it wasn't just a, a straight million of my money. But it was my biggest, I think actually, it might still be my biggest loss ever. Where is Isildur, by the way? Do, does it, does anybody know? I don't know. Nobody knows? I remember, I, I remember only the million. Okay. Actually, I remember the first time I actually lost a million, but I also remember the first time I got stuck a million. And the first time I got stuck a million was like one of my favorite sessions ever. Because I actually won like 600K the day before. And it, this is eight game mix, four and 8,000 game. Uh, you know, and we were in San Diego playing some sort of like uh, – event or whatever nobody brought me money so everybody's like you know whatever plan on credit i went like 600k the next day I, sh I jump into this game and we're like 30 hours in to playing and it is me phil ivy and gus hansen just the three of us in a san diego card room playing with one dollar chips okay we're playing with one dollar chips like literally somebody could have went to the cage brought like a stack of ones and be like oh that's you know that's 200k now right we were playing on a piece of paper and we were we had a sheet right and it was a crazy wild, you know, it's like 6 a.m., fucking third day of something. And Phil Ivey's sitting right next to me, you know, all cool as he is. He looks at me because I was stuck. Like at this point, I was stuck at like 1.2 in the game. And he's like, you broke your cherry. I was like, what fucking cherry? I was pissed. What the fucking cherry? He's like, you know, first time you stuck a, a, a milli or something like that. It was really just fucking funny the way he said it. Uh, the good news is a couple of PLO plots where I won, you know, I won it. I basically ended up winning on the session. On that one, I ended up winning 100K. Gus did not. 
Um, but the first time I actually lost a million and it stuck was 1.3. And most of it came in a PLO, in the PLO portion where we played overs with Sammy Farha and a bunch of guys at the Bellagio. Uh, and again, I'd won 600 the day before. I had seemed to have this pattern, but I lost like 1.3 million uh, in a session there. And uh, yeah, I don't remember the, the first thousand or any of that's been it was a long time ago because you know i'm uh what do you call it you know, Doug was talking about yeah. back in my day back yeah. in my day when he fucking only he had combo charts and shit like that and computer back in my day we had a fucking pen and a paper and had to figure shit out huh so, Don't so you so that's what i like to hear that's what i like to oh actually back i think i would deal out the cards count them that's He's old school down. i actually think i do remember either my first negative 100k or one of them but i think it might be my first time uh i got wrecked and heads up on a full tilt as i was coming up in stakes and it was just it was just a devastating loss and then black friday was the next day Oof. and it, am, am i am i but i was you know jokes on you guys i lost my balance <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Would have lost it anyway. He was yeah, the only guy cele- not celebrating when we got our money back uh, from from stars uh, buying yeah, full tilt. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, oh darn. So, <laughs> but Dale, yeah. the first thing I thought about when you're playing with guests and Phil with one dollar chips is how do you tip the dealer? What do you what do you tip in the dealer when you're playing? <laughs> I don't even remember how we did that. I think we might have had a side kitty of like quarters, like you just pay with quarters cash quarters, and you're doing that. No, oh, like okay. side kitty, and we were just because oh, okay. the way we do it, most high stakes games, it's like people don't like tip every hand because it's kind of just like everyone gets one dollar. So like, though so you'll throw like the dealer who sits down like twenty five or fifty or whatever the case may be, and then at the end of the down, if you want to give them more, you can. But usually, like we we have like a time pot, and then whoever wins a time pot tips the dealer. It'd be funny if you were playing like you know you win a six dollar pot and you tip fifty dollars. It would look kind of yeah. <laughs> uh, Terrence, uh, you, I know I'm pretty sure you lost 100K. I don't think you lost. I've lost on it. I've never lost a million. And I don't remember the 1K or the 10K too. No, the 100,000 was just an absolute bloodbath. It was probably like my shortest session ever because it was like I'm jumping up 500 to 1,000. I think uh, maybe it was a 1,000, 2,000 limit. And uh, yeah, I just went 0 for 18 in showdowns against Joe Cassidy. It would just, it would just like, and I would just like, yeah, guts falling out. Like, how does this happen? I think. I don't know. I, I, I don't know how it feels between the, the Doug story sort of just getting it in as like the monster favorite and then just bank ace on the river versus like the limit hold them where you just lose over every over single over. pot over and over. I don't know which feels worse. They both feel absolutely terrible. Um, but yeah, that was just, it was like one of the shortest sessions I ever played. Cause I, I would, I almost never quit people when I play heads up limit hold them, but I was just like, I went over 18. Like I can't, I can't mentally handle this. There's no way I can play well. And thank God I had like the wherewithal to actually, step away from the computer because god oh, knows wait, how much was that the famous uh, broken laptop the smash laptop no i probably broke a laptop over like some <laughs> five figure amount of money like it wasn't it was it was just like a the funny thing about that time where i broke the laptop and i threw my mouse directly into it was that so i just like picked up my mouse and i it actually it just i only intended to throw the mouse right so you know you pick up the mouse and you throw it but it was like wrapped around other stuff it catches a drink like it goes into like the computer monitor and then monitors are sensitive laptop monitors right so it's kind of like spider webs and i just i started just laughing at myself like how stupid am i like how what is what is wrong with me um, and that was, it was more funny than anything that I just like unintentionally broke the laptop monitor. I think that's, it's just one of the things I in, intended to throw the mouse and I hit the monitor and it you know it cost more money, but it, it was, it was a good lesson. I think it was the last, last physical violence I ever perpetrated on, on a piece of computer hardware. And, and that was a long time ago. So I feel proud of that. that that's definitely good. T- Terrence, did you play heads up limit? At higher stakes for a while i wasn't really familiar with that street those streets at all yeah i mean i i played mostly 200 400 but when the 500 thousand and thousand two hundred thousand two thousand games came in on full tilt i would play those with most of my action um but yeah i i would yeah i was i was at the top of nosebleed for maybe like two years and then people just kind of stopped playing and then i got worried about bots too so yeah that's <laughs> definitely fair especially in limit limit hold them so but i i think probably like i think in like 2006 2007 2008 i was playing against humans i suspect yeah right. joe cassidy uh, that's i mean joe cassidy has and i know people like stories but one of the best golf stories of all time is joe cassidy versus phil helmuth and dan phil you know that story right you mean phil ivy not phil helmuth sorry did i say helmuth yeah phil ivy yeah yeah so so cassidy and he told this on our on our old show but cassidy's playing phil ivy 
and Ivy's not very good at the time. And, and I think Joe said he had a bankroll of 200,000 at the time. And uh, he's losing to Ivy and he's trying to f- figure out a way to get even. And Ivy's got a chip. He's like 30 yards off the green or 30 yards. What's 60 that? Yards, 60 yard shot. 60, wow. 60. Okay. So he's 60 yards from the green. There's a bunker between the pin and uh, where he is. So he's got to carry this bunker and Phil's not, again, he's not very good. 60 yard shot, by the way, is not an easy shot in golf. You know, some, a lot of people, myself included, would rather be a hundred yards because it's a full swing, but 60, you got to, it's kind of delicate. Like and, Tiger Woods will probably make that shot right. Roughly 1% of the time. Yeah. So they make a bet and, and um, Phil gives him, or sorry, Joe gives him a hundred to one on 2000 to hold it. Right. 200 to one. Was it 200 to one on a thousand? Yes. Okay, so it's 200 to one on a thousand. And it's probably, and Phil's being nice. Like this is probably 10,000 to one that he holds this shot. And, and at the time Cassidy said he had a $200,000 bankroll. So if Phil holds this shot, his bankroll is gone instantly. And Phil gets up there like Phil Hybe does and fucking chips it in the hole from 60 yards and ruins Joe Cassidy. Like, God, just drop. Like, what the fuck just happened right now? <laughs> it's like there's a thousand dollars on the ground. Do you want to pick it up? Here, there's a thousand. I'll pick it up. I'll bend over for it. And he bent over for it. And he, he got bent over for it. <laughs> <laughs> that is brutal. That's the sickest story for sure. Uh, all right, right, say, before we go too far, because I, I thought about this too. So, when I started out in poker, whatever, like I made YouTube videos, right? I did some YouTube videos. Then Doug made YouTube videos, right? So I started like a training site, you know? And then Doug, you know, he starts a training site. Then on Christmas, I wear red and black pajamas <laughs> and I put my fucking little puppies. I put my puppies in red and black pajamas. Damn it. The okay? black pajamas. With my wife, and we sit in front of the Christmas tree and we take a picture with the puppies. Doug, once again, <laughs> Fucking following right in my footsteps, takes the exact same fucking picture and drives the poker world nuts because I just saw that. I was like, oh my god, what the fuck? That is really weird. And and I, I just have to say I had nothing to do with that one. I was told you're gonna wear this and we're doing a family photo with the dogs. And so I said, Okay, I'll I'll sit there. You can just do all the stuff. And your dogs were dressed, so were mine. I know. <laughs> At first, I just saw us, and I was like, that's pretty weird. And then I realized all of the dogs were dressed. <laughs> like, this is getting weird. Yeah. It was so funny because, and I think somebody tweeted, like, what kind of sim are we living in? And I just laughed. It was, it was perfect. <laughs> uh, Roscoe, do we have some uh, voicemails at all? Oh, yeah, we do. Voicemails for another time. Yeah. It's specific, though. They might, or any of them for Doug? Uh, no, there is one about the challenge, and there's one if you want to give a 16 year old financial advice. No, we'll do that. Okay, we'll do that next show. Uh, I want to thank Doug uh, for coming on the show. It was great. It was a lot of fun. Uh, good catching up with you. Congratulations on the win. Um, you know, hopefully you're uh, still poke your nose in and around poker, so uh, we don't totally lose track of you. But good luck with all the stuff you do in the future, because I know you're going to kill it. You, you you'll you'll do great. Um, and thanks to you guys for getting together. Uh, the the usual foursome. Um, And we will talk to everybody next week. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me.